Okay, so let's have another discussion. So this is a topic that I have been trying to figure out how to talk about for like quite a while now. I feel like let's just have a free flow kind of conversation here because I mean, the longer I put it off, the more I find it harder to address. So I'm just going to jump into it and see how we go. So let's talk about non-binary representation in media and how it sucks. (laughs) So some of you may know I'm non-binary. I use they, them pronouns. I've made two videos about this. They're about a year old now, but I'll link them to save time on talking about this because I don't really want to have to go over it again. You can watch those videos to get a refresher if you're not really sure about non-binary identities. I identify as trans non-binary, meaning for me personally that I transitioned from assigned gender at birth to being non-binary. With that out of the way, let's talk about non-binary characters in media. The thing with non-binary characters in media isn't necessarily the fact that they don't exist because they absolutely do. They are becoming more common now. But the problem with these characters isn't necessarily the fact that there might not be enough because, I mean, there's a few and they're recognizable, I guess. It's not that. It's the fact that they're very tropey. Generally, these tropes exist in two different sets of themes. But let's first talk about some non-binary characters that we know. This is where it's going to get frustrating. So first canon character who is genderless or non-binary or gender non-conforming, Bemo from Adventure Time. According to Rebecca Sugar, the Crystal Gems are technically genderless or gender non-conforming. There's also character in the new newish video game Apex Legends called Bloodhound who is non-binary. Apparently the developers of Kirby have announced that Kirby is non-binary which is cool. Really when I think about it there are only two characters in popular media that I can think of that are canon non-binary and like relatable to a degree. The first being Ali from Transparent. Which the show in itself has a lot of problems, whether it be casting a cis man to play a trans woman, that cis man being sexually abusive towards trans women, And then the fact that Jill Soloway, the show's creator, tried to cover that up for a while before eventually, you know, going back on that and, you know, trying to write him out of the show, which, uh, yeah, it's, there's a whole thing. But Ali was kind of exploring their gender towards the end of the last season that finished last year, I think. And so we don't have for sure that Ali is non-binary. Maybe Ali needs to explore their gender a bit more and we might see that if the show ever comes back. I'm not going to be particularly sad if the show doesn't come back because it's so wrought with like problematic shit. But it would be interesting to see the show take a direction that explores Ali more than Jeffrey Tambor's character. The second show that I can think of that has a canon non-binary character that is pretty good for representation is billions. My pronouns are they, theirs, and them. Which, if you haven't heard of it, I don't blame you, because here's the thing. The show is set around hedge funders and, like, financial specialists, so who really wants to watch that in our community? I tried. I heard about this character being introduced into the show, and I tried but I just found it really boring. So that kind of sucks, but it's kind of cool in the aspect that we have a character who's canon non-binary, uses they, them pronouns, and is actually played by a non-binary actor, Asia Kate Dillon. So that's kind of cool. 
Um, they also were in the new John Wick movie, but I don't actually know if their character was written as non-binary or not. I think Asia K. Dillon is probably the first actual non-binary actor that I can think of off the top of my head. So that's really awesome. Other lesser mentionable things are maybe if you've seen the movie Kings of Summer, uh, the character Biagio identifies as not existing inside the gender binary. Have you ever felt this at one with, with yourself, with your instincts, with nature? This, this masculine? I don't know. I don't really see myself as having a gender. Is that a problem? It's not great. That could be perceived as kind of a gag because the character himself or themselves is written as being really eccentric and strange and saying off the cuff things that don't make a lot of sense. Joe. I'm gay. Are you sure? Um... Yes. My lungs fill up with fluid every time the seasons change. That's not being gay, Biagio. What? Pretty sure that's cystic fibrosis. So, I mean, it's cool if that character was actually written with the intent of being non-binary or gender non-conforming, but we don't know that for sure because of how the character is kind of built. And then there was when Zoolander 2 came out, Benedict Cumblesnatch or whatever his name is, played a character called All, which was, I guess, gender fluid, but it was a mockery of everything that is non-binary or gender non-conforming and was like written as a joke to make fun of our community. So fuck that, like fuck that fucking movie. A character that a lot of non-binary people, like myself included, identify a lot with is Sailor Uranus, which is not canon non-binary. It's never been announced that she or they are non-binary. It's just kind of They've got that coding, that non-binary coding, but that could also be just miscommunicated as the fact that she or they are just a butch lesbian because that's how the character was originally written. It just happens to have those codings of gender non-conformity. So here's the thing with these characters that I've mentioned and how they fall into certain tropes. The first of these tropes is that non-binary characters are written as non-human, alien, or coming from a society that doesn't exist within our world's gender constructs. So they come from somewhere where gender and gender binary doesn't really exist or isn't a thing in society. So the problem with this is BMO is a portable electronic device. No one expects a computer to have a gender. So in saying like BMO is good non-binary representation is like saying a rock is good non-binary representation because you can't assign a gender to a fucking rock. The thing with the crystal gems is that falls into the same kind of themes. So the gems do use uh, female pronouns or she, her pronouns, which is like totally fine. A lot of non-binary people do prefer to use she, her, he, him rather than they, them or in conjunction with what they, them. So that's not really the problem, but the crystal gems do come from a society that is pretty much all femme presenting genderless creatures so that's, again, that non-human kind of aspect. Kirby is a pink orb that... I don't even know what Kirby is. They're a pink orb. That's not good representation. Then you think of, in instances, characters who aren't explicitly non-binary but are kind of explicitly genderless because they're not human, like the homunculi from Full Metal Alchemist, for example. They are the embodiment of pure sin. So there's inherent problems in that being that. <laughs> Thanks, like they're the bad guys and they have no gender and I don't really expect them to because they're an embodiment of something that isn't inherently meant to be humanoid in the first place. So the other trope, 
that tends to um, be created when non-binary characters are announced is the fact that they're often shrouded in mystery. And that's frustrating, especially in in reference to Bloodhound from Apex Legends. And look, I don't know a heap about Apex Legends because I don't like Battle Royale type games because I have anxiety. But from what I've read from their character synopsis, it is that they're mysterious and no one knows their background and you can do whatever you want with their background in that aspect. You could say that they come from a society that doesn't conform to gender constraints. You could say that they're an alien or a robot, you know, it's frustrating. In this trope of not having solid foundation for your character is that non-binary tends to be added in as an afterthought. You know, if you can see that you're gathering an audience of certain types of people, you'll assign those traits to a character that you haven't really built on much or left purposely blank to see what kind of representation you can cram into your show. Like, I guess there's good intention behind that. But it's just really frustrating that there's no humanization of the non-binary character. It's not kind of like telling a relatable struggle that are pretty much most, if not all, non-binary people go through in their lives. And that is, you know, discovering that they're not their assigned gender and having to like wade through that weird transition, whether it's social or there is like a medical aspect to it. And I'll explain why that is in a little bit. It almost feels like when these characters who are purposely left vague are revealed to be non-binary, it feels kind of fetishizing or commodifying to an extent. It feels like their information or their past is purposely concealed to then make a spectacle out of it, which is not exactly what you want. Honestly, Asia Kate Dillon's character in Billions is probably the only instance where it was like, I'm here, I'm non-binary, I use they, them pronouns, and I'm trying to exist amongst other peers in the workplace, and I'm just trying to live my life. We need more of that. On the subject of concealing identity, there is an instance that I will bring up where a character was heavily coded as being non-binary or gender non-conforming to have the writers completely ditch that concept and just abandon it completely and that was in the final generation of skins so there was a character freddy and in the first one to two maybe three episodes they were coded so heavily as being gender non-conforming or non-binary or even trans masculine they binded their chest, they wore purposely very ambiguous clothing, they, you know, wore clothes that would conceal their body type in many ways, and they were it was noticeable to their peers, and they were picked on for that. And then the writers of Skins decided to just ditch that concept entirely, and then rewrite Freddy as a very feminine character, and a cis woman in the end. This is a narrative that I'm still furious about and I've talked about it to other friends and they are furious about it too. I just had so much hope for this character and I was really excited about it and then they got rid of it and that's uh, probably why the season failed so fucking horribly because it was so boring. Another thing in writing non-binary characters is the failure to acknowledge that pronouns are kind of important. So with BMO, for example, they use both he, him, and she, her pronouns. A lot of the time they'll just refer to BMO as he, him, which is like, again, totally fine. A lot of non-binary people do use those pronouns and it's the same with the Crystal Gems and Sailor Uranus. But it's not the problem that they use those pronouns, but the problem that they, them is not normalized. And it's really, really important that we start normalizing they, them pronouns. It's not grammatically incorrect. It's not weird. It doesn't take a whole lot to get used to if you actively try. It becomes very second nature once you start being aware of your language. And I feel like a lot of writers tend to avoid doing this purely on the taboo kind of scale of it, that it's too weird and too uncommon for the viewer to take in, so they just don't bother. 
So the thing with writing characters that are relatable is how it changes how the public perceives your personal journey, your identity, all that kind of stuff. And I say this because in the real world, you know, you know the you know the events I'm talking about where non-binary people were seen as either an extra step that made it difficult for others to accept or you know you've got true scum saying that non-binary is just not real which is like how I feel about my gender is very real it's very visceral to me so the other thing with this is red tape and this red tape manifests in bureaucracy for example in Australia if you register at your university as gender non-conforming or non-binary or use the X marker instead of F and M, which is a thing a lot of universities have introduced, it means that you actually can't claim student welfare benefits because our, our welfare system doesn't have a gender aside from male or female. And if you're on the university records as something different, there's, there's a, a miscommunication in the bureaucracy of it. The other thing that comes from this is a lot of microaggressions, especially in workplaces, it's generally just kind of difficult to be out in your workplace as a non-binary person. I work in customer service and in hospitality, and it's a lot of the time being she heard, lady, miss, woman constantly because there's nothing really structured in the workplace to allow expression of gender or even to correct people when they misgender you without having repercussions. The other thing about this is the transmedical aspect of it. There's a misconception that non-binary people don't medically transition or there is no way to medically transition and this is not true. It's just very difficult. A lot of the time in order to gain access to transmedical help you need to lie about being a binary trans person. I've spoken to quite a few friends of mine who have had top surgery done and they've either had to go on HRT before being able to have that top surgery or they've had to lie and say that they're a trans man and that they promised to go on HRT after they have the surgery. And I don't know, it might sound kind of like ridiculous and like, weirdly semantic but like I don't have confidence in lying to a doctor it, that's what makes it difficult and unfortunately things like binders and tucking and like other gender signifiers that help us pass a little better or pass in a way that makes us feel comfortable aren't really accessible to everyone I for example can't wear binders because of my chronic pain which is super fucking annoying because it would be so easy if I could I wouldn't have to worry about the concept of I won't feel comfortable in my body until I have surgery so there is a lot of medical gatekeeping that stops non-binary people from presenting in a way that makes them feel secure in their identity if there was media representation that explored this and explored a character who you know is assigned a gender at birth and transitions at some stage in their life when they explore gender maybe it would make our struggle more digestible to the public and also humanize what we experience a little better so people can relate our struggle to something that they've enjoyed or or empathized with this is the core reason why representation is important and the core reason why developers, creators, writers, directors should be asking us what we want and not just assuming that what they create will be good enough. So, thanks. So, thanks for watching, everyone. Uh, let's get on to some recommendations. So, here's some videos I really want to shout out that you should all check out. First is by Rutgo. He made a video about the misconception that um, video games create mass shooters. Um, spoiler alert, they don't. Um, but the video was so good. Please go watch that video. Go subscribe to his channel. The next video I want to recommend is by Armchair Culture Warrior. And I'll preface this with a 
a content warning because the video I am recommending is about abortion and that's a very sensitive topic and he does explain it in a very matter of fact way so if that's something that um, could trigger or upset you maybe um, watch it with that in mind but I do really want to recommend it because it was a very good video basically he takes down Ben Shapiro's uh, quote-unquote science argument in regard to whether abortion is morally sound or not and it was really good Um, it really breaks it down in a very theorized way, which is definitely hard to refute for people who do support Ben Shapiro. Unfortunately, they do exist. And the final video or videos I want to recommend, because I honestly, I can't pick one particular video over the rest, but this morning I binge watched everything on Lipstick Linebacker's channel. Um, I'll, I'll include one video that I watched, but I really recommend you go watch all of her videos. She has such a captivating personality and a way of talking to, to the viewer. And I like was enamored completely. So I'll include the video where she talks about being your own worst enemy because I think a lot of us, especially those who make videos, can relate on an extreme level. But also subscribe to her channel because I'm super excited to see what she comes up with and I just honestly could watch her talk about anything. She's such an interesting and like very down to earth person and I highly recommend her channel. And. Lastly, I just want to shout out to my patrons. Special shout out to Hannah Jacob, Trans Rights, Justin McCulloch, and Schley. And an extra special shout out to my $10 tier patrons. All right, get ready for this one. Thanks to my $10 tier Patreons, I'm going to read it out as Marge from Fargo. So thank you to Melanie, Shadow Mage, and Eric Keen. Oh yeah, betcha. I really appreciate the uh, the uh, support. Oh yeah, thank you so much. Uh, I'm terribly, terribly, terribly sorry to anyone who's from Minnesota who I just absolutely insulted with that god-awful impression. Thanks heaps for watching. You can join my Patreon. I'll have it linked below. You can also follow me on Twitter at trenoldsucks and you can subscribe to my channel if you want to, but I'm not going to force you. And I'll see you in my next video. Bye.